I think as everyone knows, my name is Tony Aaron. I am the director of the Master of Science in Foreign Service program. I am here with Ambassador Mark Lagon, my colleague in crime and chair of our concentration in international relations and security, and Professor Thomas Banshoff, who is the director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. This conference on human dignity and the future of global institutions <coughs> is a co-sponsored event by the Berkeley Center and the MSFS program. We want to welcome everybody here. Now, it probably goes without saying that the international situation today is messy, that the international system itself is messy. Many of us were taught in our introductory courses in international relations that the structure of the international system is Westphalian, that states are the primary actors in the international system, that the world is organized based on these territorial states, and that that is how we are to understand international relations. Well, as an aside, I tend to think Westphalia was a myth even in 1648, but that's, that's a different conversation. In 1977, the late Oxford Don Headley Bull wrote a book entitled The Anarchical Society. In that book, Bull opined what the future of the international system might look like. He had several possible futures, and one of those futures is what he called a neo-medieval system, drawing upon the idea of medieval Europe, where there were territories, but, but things moved around, there were overlapping hierarchies, multiple authorities. Bull said, the current international system may be taking on a neo-medieval character. Now, what would this look like? Well, we would see states, still as we think of states, playing a role, but we would see an increasing number of intergovernmental organizations exercising authority, not just global organizations, but regional organizations. We would see supranational organizations, like the EU, playing a greater role in world affairs. We would see a variety of non-governmental organizations proliferating. We would see sub-state actors. We would see trans-state political movements and trans-state political actors. And the world would be much more messy than it is in this Westphalian vision. Well, the basic thesis of our project is that we are there, that the international system is neo-medieval in structure, that we have states, that we have IGOs, but we have all these other actors that are increasingly playing a greater and greater role and demanding and receiving the authority of individuals, such that individuals are seeing not just the state as their political authority, but a variety of these other political actors. So where does that leave us? Where does that put us in understanding how international institutions are emerging. So we're going to carry this out as a dialogue. The whole idea here is to set out some ideas as a dialogue, and even our initial discussion of our framework will take that form. In the book, in this project, we really want to look at global institutions in, of two categories, fitting this context of a neo-medieval world. There are, of course, the traditional intergovernmental organizations, and a number of people have contributed uh, pieces of writing for this project that are on those intergovernmental organizations. The United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, regional organizations. But it, it's not really appropriate in our minds to look at this world um, with a fractured set of actors as institutions and other. It's really most fair to say that there's a second category of global institutions today which represent amalgams, hybrids, partnerships. A classic example is the Global Fund um, to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, which is a combination of international financial institutions, UN entities, major foundations, corporate actors, and NGOs, among others. We want to probe some of these global institutions of the latter sort that are really multi-stakeholder partnerships, something that some of our professors like Nicole Vib and Sadaka explore in coursework here, and look at these two sets of global institutions today and 
explore what other political scientists and scholars have called the collective action problem or global governance in terms of these two sets of institutions. And it is into the exploration of these different sets of institutions that we introduce the concept of human dignity. Now, we're going to get in a moment to the specific way in which we define human dignity. Obviously, we didn't invent the term. It has an extraordinarily long pedigree. But I want to say a couple of preliminary words before Mark gives us our definition, just so we can put it in context. For someone like me who teaches and studies international law, there's a long history of discussion of international human rights law. And so you have this concept of human rights. And we've had several people in discussions about the book say, well, that's fine. Shouldn't that be enough for your project? Shouldn't this idea of international human rights be sufficient for you to carry out what you try to carry out? And our answer is not sufficient. Our claim is that the concept of human dignity is something which will encompass international human rights, encompass international human rights law, but offers something else. Check. Human dignity, welcome Professor Crocker. Make human enough. dignity is in a sense more primordial. It is in a sense prior to a discussion of human rights, and at the same time, it is the teleology of human rights. Human rights discussions, in my view and in our view, are leading to the promotion of human dignity. Now, why, why do we say this? Well, one of the concerns is that human rights discourse has, if you will, had several problems in the international political situation over the past 40 or 50 years. One of the problems with human rights discourse has been that it has tended to degenerate into this debate between civil and political rights on the one hand and economic, social, and cultural rights on the other. If you go back and look at, say, the time in which the General Assembly was giving its approval to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there was this huge debate between the West, represented by the United States, saying civil and political rights are the only real rights, and representatives of that time of the Soviet Union, some of its allies, there wasn't a whole lot of developing world that was independent in 1948, but saying, no, no, no. Economic and social rights are prior to civil and political rights. They're more important. And this debate raged back and forth. Our view is introducing the concept of human dignity transcends that debate. It says that human dignity requires both the promotion of what we would call civil and political rights, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, and so on. And it requires an acknowledgment that certain basic conditions of life have to obtain in order for individuals to have their human dignity affirmed. Jobs, food, health care, these are fundamentals to human existence and human dignity requires an affirmation of these so-called economic, social, and cultural rights. So that's, that's one of the things we hope that human dignity will help and move us beyond this sterile debate. And there's another way in which we think the concept of human dignity helps. Many of us have affirmed that we are in a, if you will, post-rights discourse era. They would say that human rights discourse got us so far, but we now need to go further. And we've seen some of this in much of the debate of women's rights, for example. If you look at the evolution of the women's rights movement in the United States and, and internationally, we find that it began with assertions that women should have the right to vote. Women should be treated equally to men. And those were fundamentally important steps that affirmed the human dignity of individuals. But much of the feminist literature and much of the debate has gone to another level, has said, OK, you need to do that. You need to establish this baseline equality between men and women, but men and women are actually not the same. Women give birth, men do not. Human dignity requires that you acknowledge that difference, that you accord the respect due to that difference. 
Of course you maintain the equality that all human beings should have, but human dignity says you go a step further. You transcend the traditional rights debate in affirming human dignity. Okay, but that begs the question, what is human dignity? Well, uh, for fear of this being like a, a cura curated Twitter feed where you decide which strains of ideas you want to select from, we have looked through traditions in the past of philosophical thinking um, that have addressed human dignity. And I'd welcome anybody, have a seat if you like, Kristen. Um, and we've, we've tried to look at the ways that this com uh, concept has emerged in shaping an operational definition, something that would be useful for looking at the way international institutions can more tangibly deliver on human dignity. The ancients, for instance, um, looked at various aspects of human dignity. Um, Aristotle looked at the concept of eudaimonia, which essentially refers to human flourishing, a concept which we'll see later in a very modern time has been picked up on by international institutions. Other thinkers uh, in ancient times looked at a concept of thymos or spiritedness of people having to do with realizing one's potential. Of course, here at a Jesuit university, it's proper for us to think of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, we'll hear more about this from Tom Banchoff um, over lunch. Um, but the, the special value of each person created uh, in the image of the creator is a concept that has been drawn by later moderns to inform human dignity. We draw fairly heavily on the thinking of Immanuel Kant that no person should be treated as a mere means, that every individual has special value. And then, of course, since World War II, much of the human rights work of multilateral institutions and treaties has alluded to human dignity. In fact, alluded to it to some respect as this pre-existing concept, this thing that comes before human rights, as Professor Aaron has, has referred to. Most notably, in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, I really commend to you Marianne Glendon's book about the drafting of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the special role played by Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, we look at some more modern um, theorists of international law. For instance, Myers McDougall at the Yale Law School crafting something that some people refer to as the New Haven School, a jurisprudential theory which places central importance on realization of human dignity, that constructs in international law ought to be designed to promote that. Now, many people will say that that was caught in a legacy of the Cold War and was a formulation designed to explain the agenda of the free world. Um, but it explicitly raises up human dignity uh, in the context of international law. Importantly, for those of you who are engaged in the study of development or working at multi uh, multilateral um, development banks, the UN Development Program, based in large part on the thinking of Amartya Yassin, Sen, um, had put uh, forward a framework for trying to um, build upon the capabilities of people, realization of a sense of a whole person and their capabilities. And in fact, the existence of the Global Human Development Program builds on this notion that there is a broader set of capabilities, um, even more um, holistic than, than mere economic prosperity and economic development. And the whole United Nations Human Development Report has been based on this concept of capabilities, which in many ways picks up on the notion of human flourishing from Aristotle. Um, I'm most influenced in this effort to look at traditions at some thinking by Francis Fukuyama. You'll recall the famous article and book, The End of History, the book The End of History and the Last Man, which suggested that at the end of the Cold War, the great ideological struggle of East and West would be transcended. There would be kind of a Hegelian dialectic 
and you'd get um, you know, reach uh, a stage where there would no longer be a great clash of ideas and democracy or notions of democratic governance would prevail. Well, they clearly haven't uh, robustly prevailed everywhere in the world. But in his work, Fukuyama stresses that concept from the ancients of Thymos. And that spiritedness, he interprets in a rather different way, actually a way that's influenced by Hegelian <coughs> that all human beings crave for recognition, crave for their special, unique identity. Our friend Todd Lindbergh uh, in this project has noted, of course, there's a dark side to that. Mm -hmm. Those who crave for recognition sometimes are those who carry out atrocities uh, and ethnic cleansing. Um, but that struggle for recognition lies at the center um, of the thrust of history. And so from these ideas in the past, we form an operational definition of dignity. It is again incumbent on us, if we are to talk about international institutions delivering on dignity for people, that we have something specific that could be more operationalized, go beyond laws on paper and treaties, but implement it. And so the two elements of our working at a definition of dignity are agency, and social recognition. Agency is at the heart of this idea of human flourishing and capabilities, that every individual should be able to use their gifts, to use religious language, to use their gifts and flourish. And that if they lack agency, they're being denied dignity. But the other element that is really essential for this is social recognition. It's not just that people are valuable. They need to be recognized as valuable in a social context. You cannot look at individuals strictly in terms of them being innately valuable. But they must feel in a social context that they're recognized. So that no single group of women or children or minorities or particular racial group or those of disadvantaged castes in India, etc are written off in terms of their value or their access to justice, agency, and social recognition. So we have this idea of human dignity that we are drawing upon ancient traditions, trying to introduce into the conversation, into a dialogue. Now, I would be lying if I didn't tell you that we're engaging in what we might call and what we do call a constructivist project. Constructivists assert that ideas matter, that concepts affect how individuals behave and how a variety of other actors behave in the international system. What we're trying to do is really twofold in this constructivist project. On the one hand, we want to introduce this concept of human dignity into the scholarly community. We want scholars, we want international legal authorities, we want other people to engage it to improve upon it, to develop it, to help it make more sense, to help it as a concept flourish. But we also want to have an impact in the policy world. Our goal, as we mentioned earlier, is to move beyond sterile debates about human rights, is to transcend the way in which some of these international negotiations have manifested themselves and offer a concept which will have a positive impact on individuals, which will have a positive impact on the role that institutions play. We're hoping that as states, as other institutions, as hybrid actors, as IGOs, as NGOs, start to conceive of their mission in terms of human dignity, it will have a better impact on bringing about peace, justice, fairness, and development in the international system. So that's our broad, understandably ambitious project in introducing this idea of human dignity. Now, how does that manifest itself in the particulars of this workshop and this book? So, you know, we're not just asserting, as Tony suggests, that okay. human dignity, clearly this is the goal for international institutions. We want to engage this dialogue uh, among opinion leaders, among intellectuals, uh, among uh, international institutions, but specifically the goals of the book associated with this project and today's workshop um, are two. 
We want to look at these two types of global institutions, traditional intergovernmental organizations like the UN and the World Bank, and these more modern uh, amalgams, the hybrids, the partnerships, the multi-stakeholder uh, institutional partnerships, and see how well are they advancing human dignity today. To what degree are they, um, as a, a descriptive matter, um, doing this? And then we'd like to explore as a prescriptive matter, how can both these types of institutions do a better job to make human dignity their central touchstone and specific modalities for advancing that? Again, returning to the notion that it's not enough to have a treaty, it's not enough to pass a law, um, it is not enough to create norms, it's important to implement <coughs> policies that are, that are realized. By the way, I want to note that the Georgetown Journal for International Affairs has launched a blog on human rights and human dignity, um, looking to pick up on this discussion. I hope some of you um, who haven't already might be interested in writing blogs and reading this as a kind of place where we can carry out some of this dialogue. So shall I introduce our panel chair? Please do. Okay. Um, I'm very pleased to um, welcome a, a friend and colleague to chair our next panel. Um, she's my former boss, Kristen Silverberg. Um, I know how my work improves when her uh, intellectual, lawyerly eye is uh, turned upon my work. Uh, Kristen, uh, among other things, is a graduate of uh, Harvard College, uh, has a JD from the University of Texas, served um, in the inner circle of advisors to candidate and President George W. Bush in her capacity in the White House. Um, as an advisor to the president and at the Domestic Policy Council, she played a hand in the crafting of the PEPFAR initiative to deal with the global HIV AIDS matter. Um, she served as Assistant Secretary of State for International Organization Affairs, where she was my boss, um, and subsequently was U.S. Ambassador to the European Union. Among her many roles now, she is president of the NGO United Against a Nuclear Iran. And we really thank you for coming and, and contributing to this. Come on up to the table. Thanks for doing this. Yes, of course. Yeah, how would you like to proceed? Do you each want to um, present? Yeah, do you, do you want to say a word to, to start and then we'll each present? Um, actually, why don't we just start with you and then we'll go straight to questions. Okay. How about that? Yeah. We're each going to, uh, Tony and I are each going to present our, our papers, and uh, Kristen is kindly going to steer a discussion, and we'd very much like to pull you in um, on this. Uh, my, my paper just came together, so I welcome those of you who haven't had the opportunity to read it, uh, to read it subsequently, um, and give me constructive, if withering, feedback. <laughs> So anyway, as some of you may know, um, my last position in government was serving as the head of the anti-human trafficking office at, at the State Department. Um, and uh, in the context of um, human trafficking, there's a US law, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, and uh, a UN treaty, the Palermo Protocol to the UN Convention on, on or Transnational Organized Crime. Both were promulgated in the year 2000. And both have basically three pillars, or three ubiquitous Ps that are referred to in the anti-human trafficking field. Both the US law and the UN treaty suggest that um, the main um, agenda items for fighting human trafficking, sex trafficking, and uh, forced labor are prosecution of the perpetrators, protection of the victims and survivors, and prevention efforts. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton began to emphasize, um, including in an op-ed in the um, Washington Post, that there should be a fourth P, partnerships, which I think I, I, one can recognize that earlier uh, Bush administration policy and UN efforts, in fact, embodied to a large degree, um, but it's worth putting a, a finer point on it. So. What partnerships between states, international organizations, NGOs, businesses, and other actors actually work? Actually, in terms of human dignity, advance um, the lives 
of either former victims or those who might become victims being shielded from this. And so I kind of explore this concept of, so what partnerships are potentially transformative moving towards, in fact, abolishing this contemporary form of slavery, which is human trafficking. And what partnerships are a little more like cotton candy? Pretty, colorful, bright, sweet, but ultimately without very much content. So I'm going to look at a few examples in areas falling under the three Ps of prosecution, protection, and prevention. And I will say that my bias is towards some examples from the United States, Brazil, and India as leading powers um, based on the premise that if institutional partnerships headquartered and grounded in these countries can't work very well to advance human dignity, then perhaps in less developed countries, they're even less likely to work. And I know that represents a bias, but there's so many examples under the sun that one could use that I wanted an error of the field. Okay. And part of my walk through this is also useful to look at those areas of work on combating human trafficking that would actually have something to do with advancing human dignity. So I hope the categories are useful too. First category, I think, that matters is researching and mapping the problem. You cannot address a massive global problem that both is a, a human rights problem and an economic and social problem without knowing what you're talking about. And there have been a lot of very flimsy statistics um, about um, this phenomenon. Um, how much of it is cross-border, how much of it is sex trafficking, how much of it is labor-related trafficking. But finally, in 2012, last summer, the International Labor Organization came out with a fairly robust estimate of 21 million people in the world who are human trafficking victims. And they're interesting uh, subsidiary findings that uh, three quarters of the victims are actually adults rather than children, and that 55% of the victims are female, even though three quarters of the victims are predominantly exploited for labor rather than for sexual abuse. Um, this improves markedly upon an earlier estimate in 2005 by the ILO, um, and it partners with scholars, with NGOs, with national governments to come to a more robust statistic than some people have, have looked at in the past. Protection, I actually think, is the most important of the Ps, the highest um, moral imperative. Protect victims you know about. But th therein lies the problem. The area of victim identification is the first step in protection. If those who are um, migrant workers, who are in um, uh, commercial sex industry settings, are not identified as victims, and in fact, worse yet, either subject to apathy or um, blame as knowing what they were getting into. Ah, this is a, you know, this is an irregular migrant. He knew what he was getting into. This is a prostitute. She knew what she was getting into. That's a problem. So a really um, remarkable um, partnership, funded in part by a Bush presidential initiative supported by the ILO has taken place in Brazil, where over the last four years, inspectors for the Ministry of Labor of Brazil have gone out into the Amazon and found people who are subject to forced labor. And over the last four years, between 2,400 and 5,000 victims of forced labor have been liberated by government um, officials uh, and uh, you know, given means for restitution. Um, and they've been involved in uh, uh, cattle raising and uh, charcoal uh, production, is, which has been used in, in smelting pig iron to create um, steel and other, other things. And that's a pretty remarkable um, effort. Immediate care of victims is very crucial. Um, I've been really struck by what one might call a bit of an ad hoc partnership. I found, um, as the head of the trafficking office of the State Department, it remarkable, uh, it remarkable how embassy after embassy of the government of the Philippines creates shelters. So many citizens of the Philippines are migrant workers sending back massive amounts of remittances as a, a part of their uh, economy, a vital part of their economy, that they have taken to creating shelters run by their embassies and oftentimes awkwardly 
coordinating with civil society organizations, which could put them in a situation of friction with host governments. And this compares rather well with a number of governments that just wants their citizens to go out, send back remittances, and uh, doesn't want to get in the face of governments. Protection also involves long-time economic um, viability. Giving a, a victim shelter, um, getting them medical care, getting them psychological care isn't enough. And so long-term economic viability is a really important part of partnerships. An example I, I thought was interesting is an organization called the Emancipation Network. Um, it's based in Florida. It works with partners uh, around the world, including, for instance, the Rescue Foundation in Mumbai, India. The Rescue Foundation, its partner, goes and finds victims of sex trafficking, in particular um, child sex trafficking, and together they work on not only giving them the immediate care, but training them to those former victims um, as survivors to be able to have jobs. And in particular, they work together in a partnership. They've formed a biogas plant in Bosar, India, where the workers learn how to secure jobs, manage programs, and in fact even are, exp are exposed to sustainable development as an ethic. Uh, of course, um, prosecution uh, is crucial, and in fact it's crucial for the justice and the dignity of the victim um, in terms of accountability of the traffickers. Here too, um, here's a case of a weaker effort. Back to the example of Brazil. So, last year, reported in the um, State Department Global Report on Human Trafficking, the government of Brazil freed 2,400 victims of forced labor. Only 10% of those cases led to a prosecution being pursued. So, accountability in the name of those victims is not very impressive. In 2011, the last year with statistics, only seven people were convicted in Brazil, in large part uh, a, an example of justice delayed being justice denied. Um, four of those uh, convicted perpetrators were, got suspended sentences. In the area of prevention, there are two key, key areas. One is basic awareness and training programs. And I think an interesting partnership is between the NGO Verite and the global human resources company Manpower. Together they've formed what's called the Help Wanted Toolkit. Um, it is essentially a best practices suite for businesses to understand through the layers of their supply chain where the recruitment of workers, including legal guest workers, might um, reflect human trafficking elements. But prevention also involves something deeper dealing with the demand side of human trafficking. If you, if you think about the human trafficking analogy to drug trafficking, there's this great debate about whether you have a supply side or a demand side approach. So a demand side approach would include grappling with the fact that males all over the world purchase commercial sex um, and that there is a hunger for cheap products and the cheapest labor in a, a, a situation of globalization. So one effort, I think, is not quite there on trying to grapple with demand. It has potential, um, but as a partnership, it hasn't quite um, gotten uh, traction. It's called slaveryfootprint.org. A former musician, Justin Dillon, has created this app based upon the concept of the carbon footprint. Raise the awareness of people about what their lifestyle may be contributing to the problem. In the case of carbon footprint, heightening the sense of what people consume and use, how that affects climate change. So funded by the Human Trafficking Office at the State Department after I left, this slavery footprint is an app or a website that you can go on and you can answer just a handful of questions about your lifestyle. Do you own a microwave? How many cars do you have? And so on. And then you get a back of uh, the envelope calculation of how many slaves your lifestyle is on the back of. I asked a research assistant to go on. She found her lifestyle is on the back of 52 slaves in the world. Um, I think it, it's, in, it's very powerful to give uh, a sense of what 
supply chains being accountable could produce as opposed to this. But even uh, advised by Stanford scholars, I question whether this back of the envelope um, calculation metric um, is the right basis for prodding businesses to do more. And then finally, resources. You have to marshal and coordinate resources. And I, I give two quick examples of the good and the bad. One very good example is the philanthropy Humanity United, which is based upon eBay money. It has a model of funding NGOs in this space of anti-human trafficking work, and not just for projects, but for operational support. The manna from heaven for an NGO is to be just given a chunk of their budget to spend as they like. And there's only one string. They must work in coalition and not fight each other for funding and try to speak with a somewhat common voice in pushing um, governments and legislators on policy. A less attractive example in the area of UN work, which Kristen and I worked on, is the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, which through its UN GIFT, Global Initiative to Fight Trafficking, took a very sizable grant from the UAE and uh, tried to use it to put itself at the front of the parade among UN agencies um, to fight human trafficking. And in large part, the money went to conferences and a few best practices reports, but didn't really advance the coordination of either efforts to fight human trafficking or the coordination and mobilization of resources. So, what are the common denominators of partnerships that are more transformative um, and less like cotton candy. They need to account for market mechanisms. They need to engage demand. They need to um, try and deal with competitive patterns, including competitive patterns between NGOs and UN agencies, each trying to raise money at the expense of the others. They need to account <coughs> for metrics um, and do it well, like the ILO did, and not in uh, shorthands, like slavery footprint. Partnerships need matching missions. You really need to make sure that there aren't some partners that are just there to look good as window dressing, like for corporate social responsibility, but like Verite as an NGO and Manpower as a company, having matching missions. And motives matter. Motives matter. And so you know, I question you on ODC's project because was their actual purpose to place themselves at the front of the parade or to really marshal resources and coordinate resources? This last idea of motives returns to thinking of, of Immanuel Kant. Not to be too abstract, but one of the great notions of Immanuel Kant, besides the importance of international institutions and that people have innate value and should not be used as means, was that actions should be um, judged based on intent. And so we should look at the intent and motives of partners in these institutional arrangements. That was excellent, thank you. Um, I just have one quick follow-up before we turn to Tony and then start a broader discussion, but um, I share your bias that these partnerships are more likely to work in places where we have resources and capacity, um, but in this area particularly, we need them to work in places that don't, Yeah. Um, and so I wondered if you could talk about when you've seen examples of success in the less developed world, what does that look like? How do they how do those partnerships work around the fact that long-term economic viability may not be, um, may not be possible? Yeah. Well, you know my wife Susan. Susan was very worried when I took the human trafficking job after working with you that I would need to see a psychiatrist regularly, having you know meeting victims of human trafficking. And I found myself actually inspired, despite how much more work mm -hmm. there was, because there are people in NGOs and in UN institutions too devoting themselves despite all the incentive structures. Sometimes they don't have a government in their home country that's cooperating with them, and, they, and I found that inspiring. So the two patterns I think that I noticed um, from my experience that, that are important are, one, if there's a partnership between a local NGO and an international NGO, it's really important that the local NGO have some serious ownership, that it is not just you know, kind of swooping in. Nicole Vivin Sadaka serves on the board of International Justice Mission. I think it's really learned that it needs to leave something behind in terms of nationals of the country being able to represent uh, victims in court uh, and so on. The other thing is, and this is true everywhere, the trust level between law enforcement and NGOs is low. Um, 
the, uh, the law enforcement think the NGOs are trying to shield victims and, and not allow them to be witnesses to help advance a prosecution. The NGOs tend to feel that law enforcement is harsh and as likely to consider someone a dirty prostitute or a deportable irregular migrant. Um, and you need that cooperation. And where one can help foster that uh, in a developing country, it's crucial. I will say that's even a problem in, in developed countries. I, I, for a short time, headed an NGO in the United States, Polaris Project. And, and if, if it achieved anything, and before and after I was there as its executive director, it was helping create greater trust between law enforcement and uh, NGOs, because the victims of human trafficking are afraid to come forward. Their tormentor will probably tell them that you're going to be treated like a criminal or a deportable uh, irregular migrant. And NGOs are crucial as a safer, more friendly face to turn to if they'll work in cooperation with law enforcement. Right. True even in the rich countries. Actually, on the subject of Polaris, your paper, I thought, had a really interesting discussion about a Polaris, Google, Lexus, Nexus yeah, yeah. partnership. Do you want to say a word about Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, so uh, Polaris Project runs a national hotline um, for the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, in its wisdom, the Department of Health and Human Services decided that it shouldn't run its own national hotline, but um, look to a uh, implementing organization. In fact, the first organization that they turned to it didn't work out so well. Um, and they uh, turned to uh, the Polaris Project, and uh, both the Bush administration and the Obama administration have uh, run processes to select Polaris Project as the implementer. So I, I think they're, it's clear there isn't political bias. Um, but that um, hotline was very difficult for a lean NGO to stand up. The company LexisNexis, which is famous for search tools for lawyers, but also for um, helping uh, government agencies organize their data, um, it decided it was going to give an in-kind contribution to Polaris Project, not just hand it money, but it constructed a, an elaborate searchable database <coughs> that allowed Polaris to map out every law enforcement unit, every NGO, um, every expert on human trafficking around the country. So if a call came into the hotline and you wanted to help a potential victim or you know, an emergency room nurse said, I want to get training on this, they would be able to very quickly respond. So now that this model has worked out rather well, um, Google Ideas has decided that they would give a very substantial grant to Polaris Project to help discuss the creation of similar hotlines with similar government NGO partnerships in other countries. Tony, do you want to say a word and then I sure. think we can have a broader discussion? Okay, yeah. great. Kristen, thank you very much yeah. and thank you so much for, for coming out. We shift from a discussion of one of the evils in the international system, human trafficking, to another evil, if I might, in the international system, terrorism. Terrorism is one of these concepts that has been playing a predominant role in our thinking, in the press, in both international and domestic institutions since 9-11. For the record, terrorism has been around since the beginning of time. There are groups that we <coughs> refer to today as assassins and thugs, which many would characterize as ancient terrorist groups that existed and, and terrorized whole populations many, many years ago. And for people who do international law and international relations, it has always been a part of the kind of issues that they would investigate. Well, what I want to do today is look at the concept of terrorism and both sort of terrorism itself and counterterrorism through the lens of human dignity. Now, to do this, I want to do three things. First of all, I want to begin with a definition of terrorism, noting for the record this is something that institutions far greater than us have debated and talked about for years and there's still no agreed upon definition so I'm going to posit a definition and I, I welcome your your criticism your your critique and your correction so I'm going to first of all do that posit a definition of terrorism secondly I'm going to offer several propositions which I think a human dignity lens would suggest for our understanding of both terrorism and counterterrorism. And then finally, I want to make a couple of recommendations as to what I think institutions could better do to address the problem, to address the challenge of terrorism. So I'm going to begin uh, with the definition. And 
and, and I'll take credit for this. This is something uh, that I've been working on for a number of years. It developed in 2002. So again, please, I, I welcome your critique. This is how I'm defining terrorism. The threat or use of force undertaken for political purposes by a non-state actor that intentionally targets civilians and other non-combatants in violation of existing law relating to the conduct of hostilities. Now I'm going to unpack that. So we start off with the threat or use of force. Sort of goes without saying. When we talk about terrorism, we're talking about the use of force. Now obviously I include killings and bombings and other sorts of very destructive forcible acts. I would also put in that category hijackings, hostage taking, things along those lines as uses of force. I do not put in here propaganda, bellicose statements, formation of ideological groups or things like that unless they result in the threat or use of force. So we could be a pernicious group of people in here contending to do all kinds of things, advocating things, but if we don't go to the point where we're actually threatening or using force, I don't think we fall into that category. So, threat or use of force. Undertaken for political purposes. This is to differentiate terrorism from criminal activity or activity of individuals who are psychotic or insane. There has to be a political purpose for which these individuals undertake these threats or uses of force. Now, in saying that, there's an intentionality to what they're doing. It's important to acknowledge that. Non-state actors. Terrorism, as I define it, is reserved for things done by non-state actors. Now, states can support terrorism. States can sponsor terrorism. States can tolerate terrorism. But if a state does those things, uses force against civilians or other non-combatants, that's either a war crime or a crime against humanity. There are other categories that deal with it, and the legal system has those other categories. So I prefer not to deal with state action in that category. So non-state actors intentionally targets civilians or other non-combatants in violation of existing law relating to the conduct of hostilities. Now, in my view, this is important. Terrorist actions are against innocent individuals. They are against civilians. They are against non-combatants. The 9-11 bombings of the World Trade Center were terrorist acts. People hijacked civilian aircraft and flew them into civilian-occupied buildings. Clear terrorist acts. My definition, actions against military or other defined state targets do not constitute terrorist action. So the bombing of the coal, as horrible as it may have been, does not in this definition rise the level of terrorism. Why? In an international system where we have insurgents, rebel groups, where we have revolution, and where we want to acknowledge the possibility of a just revolution, where we want to acknowledge the possibility that individuals should be able to rise against their government, we should allow them, and this is the human dignity lens coming in here, to be able to attack military or state targets. Those things should not be considered terrorism. There may be other laws or other rules that relate to how they are being done, but I do not put them in the same category as terrorists. So, threat or use of force, undertaken for political purposes, non-state actor, intentionally targets civilians or other non-combatants, in violation of the law relating to the conduct of hostility. So that's, that's the definition I'm offering of terrorism. Now, what does the human dignity lens tell us? How does it help us understand these kinds of actions by individuals or by groups of individuals? Okay, several propositions. First, human dignity lens tells us that terrorist acts are always violative of human dignity. Terrorism per se violates human dignity. Why? Because it is targeting innocent civilians or other non-combatants in violation of existing rules of law. Now, you may say, of course, you didn't need to tell us that. The reason I think it's important to acknowledge that is there's always this old saw that one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. In drawing this distinction, what I'm attempting to say is you may have a just cause 
but you may not undertake your just cause by targeting civilians or other non-combatants. That act is per se violative of human dignity. No matter what the reasons are, you're undertaking that act. That's what I believe one of the propositions that human dignity tells us. A second proposition that I think we can draw from a human dignity lens is that we need to be very careful in differentiating individuals, groups, and so on. So we have terrorist acts, which I have tried to define, which are always a violation of human dignity. We have terrorists. Those would be those people that commit those acts. And then here's where we get into problems. We have terrorist groups. So we call Al-Qaeda as a terrorist group. We say ETA is a terrorist group. Hezbollah is a terrorist group. But throw your favorite group uh, in there. Here's where we fall into difficulty. And I think human dignity says we have to be very, very careful. If a group, as a matter of its fundamental policy or identity, says, we will do these acts. That is what we do. That is how we behave. Then we can probably properly call that group a terrorist group because it's part of its MO. It's part of its very identity. But a lot of groups out there where some individuals that are members of that group might commit acts at times. Sometimes groups undergo change, where at one point in their history they commit these acts, at another point in their history they don't commit these acts. Jerry Adams was recently meeting with the President of the United States. Many would have said he belonged at one point to a terrorist group. Does he now? It's important for a human, from a human dignity perspective to be able to say, OK, Let's not make a blanket, broad brush statement of a group as a terrorist group, unless we can find that it's, it's in the group's DNA. And let us understand that the group can change. It can undergo a change in its identity and its motives and its fundamental means of operation. It's very important from a human dignity perspective to acknowledge that. The other aspect of differentiating individuals from groups is understanding if an individual commits a terrorist act, that individual is a terrorist. If an individual belongs to a group, we have to be very careful about immediately labeling that individual as a terrorist. We have to look at what that individual does, how well that individual is connected to the terrorist groups. And I note this because in some legislation, there are all kinds of concepts out there about providing material support, uh, being associated with a group. Human dignity says we need to be very, very cautious. We don't want to label an individual as culpable simply because of some disconnected association with a group. We want to make sure that if an individual is accountable, is doing things, that yes, of course, we hold them culpable. But we need to be very, very careful. And I think we've seen a tendency, I don't think we have seen a tendency since 9-11 to paint things with a very, very broad brush. I think it's very important to draw those distinctions between individuals and groups and actually look at what the group is doing and what the individual is doing. Third proposition, and this relates to counterterrorism. I think it's important, and this draws upon the just war tradition, it's important to be able to acknowledge that a forcible response to a terrorist act, to a terrorist group, is permissible. Human dignity says, yes, you can use military force to prevent, to deter, to stop a terrorist group or a terrorist act. Traditionally, laws of war were murky on this. You tended to think of responding to states that engage in these kinds of activities. I think after 9-11, the UN Security Council was very clear from a legal perspective that the acts of al-Qaeda on September 11 rose to the level of an armed attack under the UN Charter, empowering states to take action in self-defense. I think that's right. I think human dignity says that. You can respond forcibly to terrorist acts. Now, I think it's also important to note that just as customary international law limits the state to acting only out of necessity and responding in a proportionate way, so too in responding to terrorist acts, the actors that do this need to respond out of necessity and in a proportionate way. And proportionality I'm interpreting as proportionate to ending the threat. But I think it's very important to look at those limitations. But you need to acknowledge that use of force to counter terrorism is, is completely permissible. Fourth proposition, 
human dignity says that when individuals who are terrorists are captured and detained, they must be treated humanely. They must be treated humanely. One of the problems with the Geneva Conventions, and in particular the third Geneva Convention, which is the one dealing with prisoners of war, is that it's unclear how individuals that we would call terrorists fall under the protection of the third Geneva Convention. And this was a matter of great discussion in the United States and, in, and elsewhere. And we saw memos by people like Jay Bybee and, and John Yu making various claims about these individuals not being entitled to any protections under the Geneva Conventions and, and so on. Now, from my perspective, and I'll get to a recommendation later on, the best guideline is to treat these individuals as though they were prisoners of war fundamentally and basically. Look at the Geneva Conventions. Look at the basic protections there and say, human dignity says we're going to err on the side of giving you these protections under the Geneva Conventions. Whether we're legally required to, th that's, a, that's a different issue. Whether we're legally obligated to do it is a different issue. But the concept of human dignity says we should affirm the individuals and we should do this by giving them these kinds of guarantees. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that we need to use a common sense definition of torture. And again, not to keep throwing barbs at someone like John Yu or, or Jay Bobby, but we need to understand torture in the common sense way we would, uh, something that causes severe pain or suffering. I think people have a sense as to what that is. You err on the side of being cautious. You err on the side of protecting the individual, not on the side of saying, well, uh, unless it causes organ damage, it's, it's not torture. So I think it, it says that. It also says, treating these individuals humanely, that we should be very careful of this concept of indefinite detention. In traditional warfare, individuals who are prisoners of war can be detained lawfully until the end of the conflict. OK. Well, we knew what that meant with World War I. We knew what it meant with World War II. Uh, we even knew what it meant with Vietnam. But what does that mean on a scale where we're talking about a global war on terror? Does the conflict go on forever? and these individuals be subject to indefinite detention. Those have been the arguments that have been made as best as I can understand it by the last two administrations, the last two presidents. Well, human dignity says, let's revisit that. Let's look at some kind of review that we can give of these individuals. Let's not just say, well, the conflict goes on forever, therefore we can have indefinite detention. So final proposition that I think a human dignity lens offers. Terrorism, while always a violation of human dignity, and we do not want to condone terrorist acts, terrorism nonetheless comes from something. It is being undertaken for a political purpose. There are reasons why these groups undertake these actions. And while we may say this mode of behavior is unacceptable, the reasons why these individuals or groups may be doing these things may have merit. A human dignity lens says we need to look at the causes. We need to look at the reasons why individuals or groups engage in terrorist actions, and we need to try to address them. And there are all kinds of discussions as to what these reasons may be. They may be situations of poverty. They may be situations of failed states. They may be global governance issues or local governance issues or rule of law, a whole host of circumstances. Human dignity doesn't say, well, we need to say, OK, well, therefore, this is fine, or that we need to do whatever the people are saying. But human dignity does say we need to look at those root causes, and we need to construct a system such that we can address them. OK. So those five propositions, uh, a couple basic recommendations. These are recommendations for institutions. So the first deals with norms relating to the treatment of terrorists. I mentioned earlier it's unclear how the Geneva Conventions apply, and there really is room for discussion and debate. Uh, my recommendation is you just assume that they should apply, and then human dignity would best be served that way. Well, while I believe that to be true, I think that international institutions collaboratively should work to establish clearer norms about the treatment, 
detention, and so on of terrorists. Now, what am, what am I suggesting here? I would like to suggest a new Geneva Convention, but Mark and I were on an orals panel this week, and we asked the person the question, and, and she said, I don't think we're going to get a new Geneva Convention. And, and I actually agree. I don't think we're going to get a new Geneva this Convention <laughs> uh, anytime soon. That having been said, NGOs, IGOs, and states have always been involved in the development of international humanitarian law. The International Committee on the Red Cross, a critical NGO, plays a vital role in both developing norms and monitoring and, to some degree, enforcing these norms. Organizations like the ICRC, like the UN, states like the United States, Canada, and others, need to work to develop a set of norms. Perhaps these are done through the context of the Security Council. Perhaps these are done in other areas. I don't have any delusion that they're going to be rules of law. We'll see the next Geneva Convention in a couple of weeks, or even a couple of years, or even a decade. But if we can create these rules, if we can create a, a modus vivendi, which these actors can buy into, we may give rise to the evolution of customary rules on these things. I think a lot of it requires leadership of the ICRC, but I also think it requires leadership of the United States as a national institution stepping in here and saying, okay, we've had some problems in this area. Here's how I think we need to move forward. So that would be the first recommendation. These panoply of institutions, NGOs, IGOs, need to work to develop norms about the treatment of terrorists. Second recommendation, we need better judicial institutions to try and prosecute these individuals. We need better judicial institutions. Now, now what do I mean? Well, internationally, we have the International Criminal Court, and our, our friend and colleague, Todd Lindberg, has written on the role of the ICC. Yet, many of these acts I've described don't actually fall under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. Maybe there would be ways to empower the court to be able to try some of these individuals engaged in these activities and I would encourage states and the international community through the United Nations to work to do that. So that'd be the first recommendation relating to these judicial institutions. Secondly, the United States has had a very, very difficult time figuring out what to do. A number of years ago, when individuals were being captured and taken to either Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan or Guantanamo, the president issued an executive order saying, okay, we're going to try these individuals in a military commission. Well, the Supreme Court weighed in in Hamdan versus Rumsfeld and said, oh, you can't do that. That actually violates both the Uniform Code of Military Justice and the Geneva Conventions. So then Congress said, okay, well, we'll engage. Congress adopted the Military Commissions Act, which set forth a way in which these individuals can be tried in military commissions. So that was sort of put out as, as a possibility. Then the Obama administration said, well, we want to try them in federal district court. Can't we try these individuals in federal district court? And Congress said, no, you can't actually try these individuals in federal district court. We don't want it to be done that way either. Well, it's clear there's no transparency on this issue. And by that, I mean it's unclear where these people are supposed to be tried, what venue they're supposed to find some form of justice and some form of affirmation of their human dignity. My sense is the United States needs to figure out how to do this. And it may come in the form of a clear law which delineates criteria that could be used to determine where and how these individuals should be tried. Some individuals have suggested that there could be a special national security court that might try these individuals. I'd want to see that spelled out before I would, I would support it. But the problem right now is the way in which the United States presents the issue is that we can try these people kind of anywhere we want to. And that doesn't sound like it's affirming human dignity. It sounds like it's forum shopping. We'll try you in federal district court if we think we can get a conviction there. If not, we'll try you in a military commission or we'll send you someplace else to another country where they will try you. Now, I can understand from a legal perspective, under US constitutional law, the president probably has the authority to make those determinations. But from the standpoint of affirming human dignity, it sends the wrong message. So my conclusion, we need to look at terrorism and counterterrorism through this lens, through the lens of human dignity. If we do that, 
It can help us improve the role of institutions, and, and not to put too final a uh, point on this, but it can also help us get beyond the legal debate, well, the law says this or the law says that, and allows us to say, okay, the law might not give us all the answers that we need to address the question, or, heaven forbid, the law might be wrong. Kristen. Thank you. I had a follow-up about your um, point about how we talk about terrorist groups, because it's true that we can think of historical examples of groups that abandoned the use of violence and became legitimate political players. Um, but the way this question comes up, I think, more frequently today is with groups that have one camp in violence and one yeah. camp in the political process. So the sort of Hezbollahs or Hamas. Um, Sinn Féin, yeah, back in the day. Back in the day. And so, and, and in those cases, um, I think there's a real question about whether you can treat their political entity as a legitimate player, because it seems to me that one of the characteristics of being a legitimate player in the political process is that everybody knows that you've abandoned violence as a tactic, that you'll resolve your differences through the political system. And so, anyway, I wonder if you talk about, do you, in your view, do we separate, do we think of Hezbollah as part terrorist, part something else, or is the fact that they've, they've kept a foot in violence mean that we think of them as a terrorist group? So, it's a good question. A lot of it depends on the more specific question that we're asking. So if we're asking the question, uh, okay, we just uh, arrested somebody who's associated with the political wing of Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we deal with that person? Do we deal with that person as though they're guilty of all the crimes committed by these other uh, elements? Maybe. It would depend upon that individual's connection to that group, whether they knew or reasonably should have known that things were going on, and, and how much we can really hold them accountable. So that's one question. If we ask the question, do we negotiate with the political wing of this entity, it raises, I think, a whole series of issues as to how we deal with, with terrorist groups or with their political wings, and do we negotiate with them. The United States, over the years, has said we do not negotiate with terrorists. I would, first of all, say that's not actually true. It's, it's not true about the way the United States has behaved. And I think here's where prudent statesmanship really needs to enter in. Uh, there are times where the best answer is, you know what, no, we're not going to deal with you all because it's going to cause all kinds of problems. It's going to delegitimize this, that, and the other. And there are other cases where we are going to have to, to deal with them. So I, I would say if there's a political wing, it allows us to negotiate with them better than if there isn't a political wing as opposed to, you know, we're, we're going into some darkened room and everybody has their, their face covered and we're, we're interacting with people who, who are doing the terrorist acts themselves. So it's easier to do it if you have a separate political wing. But I think prudence is really the, the indicating factor. We have to look at the particulars of that situation and make a determination as to whether it would be in the best interest to enter into some kind of relationship or some kind of negotiation. Maybe we don't do it directly. Maybe we do it as, through a third party. Maybe we do it through uh, some kind of broader uh, multilateral scheme. But again, the, the particulars of the situation would determine to me whether we negotiate with that group. That, to me, that raises another question. This is one where I'd love to hear um, from everyone else. But, but one of the issues that's presented by this question of whether we negotiate, for example, with the Taliban um, is that um, is that one of the things that would be on the table in that negotiations would be our involvement in the um, in domestic political affairs in Afghanistan, and particularly in the treatment of women. And so there, um, that's an example where we might be able to achieve some kind of gains in terms of negotiating a different mm -hmm, mm -hmm. different kind of relationship with the Taliban, and we might be able to argue that that would advance our counterterrorism agenda. Um, but we would be putting at risk another part of our human dignity mm -hmm. agenda, namely how we advance the status of women. And so I wonder how you think about when there are dignity claims that are competing, that's how we think about that. Interesting question. So that, that's a really important question because generally speaking, uh, we don't have a situation where, well, we can either do something which will be destructive of human dignity or something else which will promote it. And we obviously want to do that. Frequently, foreign policy is confronted with those particular choices, where we have to choose between competing evils or competing goods, and where enacting in one direction may be destructive of other values, 
uh, acting in a different direction may be destructive of yet another set of values. I think that's the reality. I would again, and this is not necessarily a, a, a great answer because we need to look at the specifics, but I would say that's where prudent statesmanship will enter in. We'll have to look at what those values are. In theory, acting out of a human dignity framework will at least help us because that'll be something that will be front and center. So we'll be seeing promoting human dignity as one of our goals, but we have to look at those values and we have to say, okay, in, in the long term, which course of action will both will be best at presenting human dignity, uh, at promoting human dignity, at promoting other values, and that's the way in which we, we need to act. I said, I wish I could say, oh, we're always going to go here, we're always going to go there. It's really going to depend on, on the circumstances. If you look at U.S. foreign policy, for instance, the United States had a lot of unsavory people that it had as allies, oh, it still does actually, that it had as allies over the years. And I know people at various points, say when the Carter administration came in, they said, well, how, how, how could we do this? How could we do that? Well, it's because there, there are all kinds of other values acting in there. Now, sometimes it's a matter of not immediately deferring, oh, well, of course, everything's bad, so I have to support this person. In other words, sort of rethinking and looking at our goals and reevaluating it's important. The other thing is thinking about the way in which we do it. So Jimmy Carter made the statement that the Shah of Iran is America's <coughs> best friend. Now, I'm inclined to think the Shah of Iran was a lot better than what followed in Iran, but maybe he shouldn't have said that. So maybe there are ways in which we can make the tough choices, but perhaps use means or at least use rhetoric in such a way that it doesn't look like we're celebrating the more negative aspects of what they do. So if, in other words, if we had to enter into some kind of agreement with, with the Taliban, let's say, uh, you wouldn't do it and say, oh, this is the best regime ever, and then they treat women wonderfully. You, you may be able to get your agreement and not make that kind of acknowledgement. Anyone else want to hop in on that question, either on this negotiation point or um, how we deal with competing claims? Yes. I have a question, um, Professor Aaron. It's, I think it all sounds great. I think it's important to advance human dignity, but when you're talking about these more contentious issues, how do you really mobilize support from these more traditional or hybrid institutions or actors within governments to, to actually take these these issues kind of seriously and start promoting them. And that's sort of more compete a competition between dignity as a claim and some other claims. Right. Either operational or pragmatic and whatever it is, how do you mobilize that support? So that's a good question. I mean again, not to sort of put it off, but a lot of it would depend on what institutions we're talking about, how we're trying to motivate them, what we're trying to motivate them to do. One thing I would say is, and this in a sense goes to our, our overall purpose and our overall uh, mission, if you will, in this project, is to demonstrate to institutions that promoting human dignity is in their own interest. This is something they want to do. This is something that's going to be conducive to them realizing whatever the goals of that particular institution is and making that claim. That involves explaining what human dignity is, understanding the institution and what its goals are, and then being able to connect the two. But again, we need to look at the particulars to get a specific plan of action. I have a follow-up on that, actually. Mark you might want to hop in. But. but I felt like in the Bush administration, some of the greatest advances we made on the human dignity agenda were when we were willing to, um, to work outside international institutions. And PEPFAR is a very good example. So we had a choice between pursuing working through the Global Fund or working bilaterally. And we put the vast majority of the resources through the bilateral program. And I think in hindsight, that turned out to be the right call and allowed us to move very quickly. Um, and some of the cases, I think, where we had the greatest frustration, which Mark will remember well with me, were cases where we felt obligated to work through um, through the UN. So Darfur is a great example. We were waiting and waiting and waiting, and it was sort of a great example of the moral hazard of the Security mm -hmm. Council. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Which we're seeing in Syria right now. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And so I wondered if you could just, maybe you could both tackle this question of, is there something about international organizations themselves that creates this obstacle to, um, to advancing human dignity? Mm -hmm. And if not, what are the ones that do it that ha either because of their mandate or their structure are better positioned to be good partners? I, I can, I'll make, let me make a general and then Mark, can, Mark who spent more time uh, working with these institutions. 
So first of all, I think it's very insightful to say, if you want to accomplish something, you need to look at the best way to do it and see what works. Uh, for instance, the Landmine Treaty. The Committee on Disarmament was working on this through the UN and working on it, working on it, and the Canadians and all kinds of civil society institutions, Lord Axworthy and everybody said, you know, this is nonsense. We're going to put together our own process, put together an international agreement, and that's how you got the Landmine Treaty. It was basically a recognition that the existing institutions that the UN had developed weren't working. I think you need to be flexible and, and nimble to do that. Here's one of the problems with existing international institutions, in my view, whether they're IGOs uh, of a global level or regional organizations is they have entrenched bureaucracies, they have entrenched procedures, they have vested interests, and some of that can be good. It can, it can, it can give you a certain kind of stability, but it can also mean it is extraordinarily <laughs> difficult to get anything through those institutions, and in particular to get anything through in a timely fashion. So, in my view, that doesn't mean you need to abandon them. That just means you need to have that as sort of one track. But depending on what you want to do, I think to be PEPFAR is an amazing example of success. It needs to be celebrated, I think, as much as possible. Amazing example of success. And there are other things we can point to. I think if you're a, a leader, whether a national leader or a leader in an intergovernmental organization, you need to think creatively about other ways of doing it and finding workarounds. It's kind of sad that you need to do that, but I think one of the claims that we're making is with all these hybrid and new institutions, they actually offer more possibilities of success. And I said, Mark has spent many, many years doing these things, so he can give more detail. That's a good, very good question about problems of multilateral institutions promoting human dignity. So, I mean, you start with this proposition you often hear in this field that a multilateral institution is more legitimate. Well, we should focus in on that, it doesn't mean it's more inclined to promoting human dignity. It just means it's more inclusive. Um, so one of the more interesting things that you hear often from liberal and conservative critics of the UN is that it's politicized. Uh, to which I respond, duh. It is, of course, politicized. These bodies are political. And um, so I think if you were to try and distinguish which institutions are more likely, which multilateral institutions are more likely to advance human dignity, um, implementing agencies are more likely to advance human dignity or deal with a problem like human trafficking than a political body. So, you know, when you have UNICEF working on children who are subject to either child labor or um, child sex trafficking, it's more likely to advance human dignity um, than the UN General Assembly, uh, at the behest of Egypt, Pakistan, and Belarus, adopting a grand strategy for dealing with, with human trafficking um, in the political body. In many ways, people say unilateral efforts are illegitimate, but in some ways, these political bodies and multilateral institutions essentially sum up a series of unilateral mm -hmm. Sovereignty-focused, self-interested, non-dignitarian um, goals. Um, so, in some institutions, there's a weighted voice for other, uh, for key players, um, or there's a structure that is um, not so subject to um, the pol political body. So, it was one of the reasons President Bush proposed a UN democracy fund that would be insulated from the UN General Assembly's voting and budget. Um, and that allowed the UN to work and promote NGOs um, advancing democracy because it wasn't tied to the politics. And I thought, it, I mean, one thing the democracy fund does um, that um, some of the agencies do as well is um, minimize the free rider problem. So the participants were the ones who are willing to contribute resources and time and energy to the problem. Um, and that didn't mean they were all on exactly the same spectrum of democratic development, but it meant that you were less likely to get the country that was just casting the, um, just casting a vote on. Yeah, exactly. I'm afraid. Well, we hope to sharpen chapters for the book. So what withering questions do you have based on our presentations? Or a lot of some of you reading. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah.
I have two sort of. And by the way, for the purposes of others who may not know, Wally, why don't you all yeah, introduce I'm, yourself? Yeah, oh, sure. I'm Rossi Harris, and I chair the International Commerce and Business Concentration. Thank you for your presentation, and thanks for your moderation. Um, I have sort of two interrelated questions. One is, how do you politicize the issue of human dignity in a positive way? Mm -hmm. Meaning, how do you bring it to the, the degree to which this is an agenda item that needs to be advanced? How do you make it part of the public discourse in the democratic, democratic uh, systems that require that kind of discourse in order to advance an agenda? And number two, sort of related, I think, uh, is that you mentioned two pillars of human dignity. One is agency and the other one is sort of social recognition. Well, that seems a bit problematic in terms of being universal and you get into more collective societies or community-based societies where the human, where the social recognition piece might be resonating, but the agency piece might not so much. So I thought maybe you could address those. Do you want to? Yeah, I can. I can. Uh, I can take a stab, and then you can correct me. Uh, a couple things. So first of all, your the question about politicizing human dignity. That's actually a good way to think about it because that's what we're trying to do. Uh, well, one way we can do it is we can put together a workshop and put together a book and get people out there talking about these things. Another way is to have an influence on both governmental agencies as how they think about these issues. Uh, resolutions of the Economic and Social Council, things along those lines. I know Mark and I were at a meeting, the State Department, when was that? Uh, about a year ago. About a year ago, and we were talking about the concept, and they were talking about trying to put together some kind of a resolution for the Economic and Social Council that would be affirming human dignity. So those are, those are some ways, I think, in which, in which you can do it. I mean, part of it is taking agency ourselves, getting it out there, communicating it, and trying to get some kind of resonance. Now, needless to say, people throw all kinds of ideas out there, and they don't get resonance. One of the reasons we think this idea has that kind of resonance is because it, are, it builds upon a growing tradition of human rights, but seeks to go beyond it, broaden it, and move it in important critical directions. So we're not doing this de novo. In other words, we're not just introducing a concept that that already has no basis. We're introducing something and hopefully building upon that. You want to add a little bit to that? Yeah. I also want to comment on his, but go ahead. Yeah, I, I just, I, actually, I'm going to use your question to, to get across an idea that I haven't had an opportunity to, because you have a good pair of questions. It is an interesting question about whether agency is something that does not um, pertain in all cultures. And I'd be interested in hearing um, Tom's presentation later about different faith traditions and different cultural um, contexts. But, you know, we are suggesting these are universal. And while we're suggesting that there needs to be an intercultural dialogue uh, about human dignity, we are saying these are, you know, inherent things. So we are not abandoning the human rights tradition. We're not um, suggesting that these are culturally specific. Um, and so, in a way, the question about politicizing human dignity um, that may be even more interesting than a domestic context is in a global context. So where do you have this dialogue about whether agency and, and social recognition should be the main goals of your policies, of your World Bank programs, of your global funds, and so on? We don't think you actually literally need a new San Francisco conference and I actually don't really think the UN is necessarily the right place to have this dialogue. Where, where, how, where do you politicize human dignity? By the way, I, I challenge just for some of you, go do a, a search. Google how many times the last two presidents have invoked the expression human dignity. It's a remarkable amount. Um, and it does raise a question, what's going on here? Um, so Obama won and Obama won too? No, I mean, uh, Ob 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 Obama won and, and... And I will say President Bush talked you. about it. <laughs> yeah. President Bush talked about it as a domestic policy issue, too. I mean, a lot of the things like treatment of prisoners, um, the agenda for prisoner families were all related to... Well, and and you know. he knew um, President Bush back from Texas days. He used to say as a governor that um, you needed to avoid the soft bigotry of low expectations. Uh, and he was very, you know... Republican Party seems to be rediscovering the idea that maybe immigrants are, you know, really great, valuable part of our um, society. 
Um, but that, that idea kept being applied in many ways internationally as well. There should be no category of people that's sort of wiped out as seen as, as not ready for rights, including women in the Middle East. Do you, do you, have, a, do you have an idea about how, how do you actually like multilaterally get this idea to stick? Where would you go to have this dialogue? Well, I mean, I think you're, your paper hit at this um, point that one of the things that's been successful in the U.S. is this interesting coalition of, um, of you know, across the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. That so everything mm -hmm. from traditional human rights groups to yeah, Christian so conservative the bar groups, etc. Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the places where I've seen in the international context, the places where I've seen this agenda work best is where. Um, we've left space for basically all of those groups to participate. And so global health is a great example where Bono has been, you know, has, has as many friends on the right as he does on the left, and he d he'll talk to anybody, and he, um, anyway, so I guess that's one thing I'd say is don't exclude anyone from, from the conversation. Um, uh, I'm going to pick up on something Bob said. It kind of goes back to the, the foundation of the whole conversation this morning about human dignity. and. Uh, uh, the focus was on human agency as a problematic concept, but I wonder whether recognition is not a problematic concept. Recognition as what? Uh, we recognize your value as a wife and mother, not as a citizen or an entrepreneur. And who does the recognize? Because I think societies that do not share American enthusiasm for uh, gender issues, for example, and, and women's liberation might say, uh, we do recognize the role of women. It's a different role of women than the one you have, but we recognize it. It's legitimated. So what's wrong with that? So I, I, I gather, and you may want to speak to this, but you know, 14 of our students just went on a, a trip, uh, seven men and seven women. Um, to Saudi Arabia, and there were there was a lot of dialogue about this kind of issue. You don't recognize women's rights, and the response was, well, "We do recognize the special role of women." You don't recognize. Women's rights. Um, I remember this in discussions about people who were migrant workers or domestic servants in Gulf countries, and I said they're vulnerable to becoming human trafficking victims. Oh, well, we invite them to be parts of our family. We care for them. And so this idea that Tony raised earlier of according dignity is not necessarily treating everybody as exactly the same, you know, the sort of new feminism, th this is a, a double-edged sword. Um, mm -hmm. that so how do you distinguish in your conversations about dignity between acceptable But I, I guess I owe you an answer, recognition by whom? And I, I think it by government, sort of access to justice, that all, all mm -hmm. groups have equal access to justice, but I think, you know, by society, and I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, who imposes on an, one ethnic group, ethnic majority, not to treat an ethnic minority in a country as vermin, but society as a whole is what um, we I were think positive. The, 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 the statement that Tony made, which was an interesting one about recognition of differences and sort of uh, honoring differences is, a, is an interesting but seems to be sort of tricky it's area to kind of deal with. Yeah, some, some of our friends who are a little antsy about us talking about human dignity rather than human rights and are we slipping away from UN instruments are, you know, might be concerned about that too, but I, we're trying to launch an intercultural dialogue that could account for some different nuances in, in different places. I think somewhere in there is this, this concept of not merely tolerating differences, but celebrating yes. diversity. And, uh, but exactly the key multiple choice. Well, pardon? But, but, but what, that, what that, the philosophical basis of that, the foundation of that, I think needs maybe some further examination. And part of it, too, is it, 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 we are trying to begin a dialogue, and so we at least want to say we, we, we have some fundamental ideas. We don't have all the answers. And so one of the areas in terms of celebrating difference is understanding that human beings are independent. They are autonomous. They are different. Groups are different. Men are different. Women are different. People who are disabled are different. 
And so trying to acknowledge that, recognize that, attribute the respect to that. Now, what does that mean as we interact with other societies? I think in the, in the good Jesuit tradition, there's a real dialogue. We have certain views based on our understanding, but we do want to hear from other people and other societies. And I think as we put human dignity on the table with our explanation, we can get some responses and move toward a better dialogue. If, if we look, for instance, at human rights law, I would say international human rights are certainly not implemented the way I would have wanted them to be implemented at the end of the day. But the fact that they're on the table in ways they were never on the table before World War II, the fact that societies have made fundamental changes, even amidst all kinds of different interpretations, indicates to me that throwing the concept out there, having states, non-governmental organizations, individuals grapple with it, has had a positive impact. And our hope is that putting this concept of human dignity on the table, while we don't know all the answers, will have that kind of positive impact. So it's an ongoing thing. Again, that may seem like a non-answer, but that's at least our hope. Run a little long, but if you have to split the eleven, it's fine. Yes. I was just going to throw out there that building on what Michael said, um, one of the important things in this concept is also moving past toleration to what human dignity and actually recognition and understanding. And I think it would be important um, to look at specifically what the faith community's role in that has been, in large part because where faiths come together, that can be where the real yeah, tension absolutely. can hit because it's not just recognizing someone of another gender or another. Um, race, but actually someone who has firm deep beliefs that you find completely different. But there have been faith traditions who have been able to come together fully embracing a concept that they fully disagree on theological differences, yet the concept of human dignity has been able to, they may not call it that, but this concept that you move from just tolerating the other to recognizing that you have that unity. Um, there may be some good examples within that framework that I think are really important to, to see how that that bridging works. Really good idea. Yes, thank you. I'm Rosalia Rodriguez Garcia from uh, the World Bank. Not in an official capacity, should we say that? <laughs> um, uh, this is really so interesting and another kind of uh, discussion we are often engaging, so I am enjoying it very much. A, a common and, and, and then Two comments actually. One is this issue of the definition. Um, I wonder if something that you may like to address in the paper is uh, whether the definition, I think you mentioned, Mark, is not a universal truth. Bon, is this a universal truth or is a social construct? It might be that the agency component is inherent and is closer to a universal truth and that the social recognition, and I think maybe Michael was alluding to that in the interview, is more of a social construct. And this might be one of those things where we don't have the right answer, but maybe it's a question that should be raised in, in, the, in, the, in the paper. Of course, if you say it's a social construct, then the other side of the point is that everyone in every society, is, every faith is going to define what they mean by it. And that is something that talking about global institutions UN is dealing with constantly, because everyone has different definitions of exactly the same terms. So just something to address perhaps a little bit more. The other thing is in the trafficking, in the human trafficking subject, um, is there, and, and I, I have not read your paper in detail, so my question is, um, do you, in discussing human trafficking, did you address the issue of the individuals, the free choice that some individuals, not everyone, but some individuals have to actually go someplace and pay someone $20,000 and get in a truck? Clearly, there is an aspect of, of um, uh, individuals who, because of TV or because of, of, um, of uh, uh, publications and, and, and marketing, they believe that there is a better world out there yeah. or there. And they will risk anything. And then they become victims of human trafficking. And of course, there is the other side of the coin, which is the people that are in the business of, of human trafficking for whatever reason. And I wonder if, if you are addressing that in the paper. And, and, and I just think it is an interesting subject to be intellectually honest 
to uh, accept that some of these people are actually choosing to get into difficult situations. Well, good um, comment on whether things are universal truth or a social construct, and I think we should probably talk to our, uh, our colleague who couldn't be here today, uh, Kate McNamara, about this as a, 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 because she's very interested in, uh, from a constructivist point of view um, about this. It, maybe Ross's comment is that maybe even agency is uh, you know, more of a social construct than a universal mm -hmm. as well. As far as your question on human trafficking, um, <laughs> Uh, there's a special circle of hell for the recruiter uh, of uh, human trafficking victims, but it, I think you find it's not actually the very most desperate people in a situation of globalization who are the victims of human trafficking for those who would argue that poverty is the cause. But it, it, it's someone a rung up who's willing to take some risk and very often um, one form of a victim of human trafficking pays an enormous amount to a recruiter to move them across a border or, or even to place them in a job as a regular migrant guest worker. But they pay something, like for instance, someone from Nepal or the Philippines pays the equivalent of two years salary to become a construction worker um, in a Gulf country and they find that the, the nature of the work is very different from what they expected, um, that they have their passport taken away, and in fact, um, they're so deeply um, in debt bondage that they're stuck there. Um, and if they flee because of the nature of sponsorship laws in the Gulf, um, you know, that they'll be subject to, to punishment. So, yeah, I mean, there is a sort of agency that leads some people to um, cross a border, um, or even to go sometimes into um, the sex trade, um, it, at, at some moment the agency ends. It's actually a tricky situation that because of force, fraud, and coercion, someone who worked to become an irregular migrant, yeah. get across a border, actually moves from a situation of uh, you know volition to actually being caught up as a human trafficking victim. Uh, Catherine Marsh, I'm from the Book Berkeley Center. But just following up on this, uh, bringing in the gender dimensions, my sense is that this is something that really does deserve uh, to be treated in more detail. They, it's where, in human rights, I think there are a lot more issues uh, and questioning of what it means. And given that it's 51% of the population, uh, <coughs> perhaps arguably the most important human rights issue for the 21st century. I think it does deserve special treatment. I was struck um, reading, I've, I've been concerned by backlash against women's rights and so sort of what is feminism and so forth, which is in a sense a different issue. But in the dignity concept, you get into what do the words mean and what do they suggest and of course you go the derivation and all of the different connotations. I came across one that I sent to you the other day um, that I thought was very interesting. It's from the call of one of the young women uh, during the Arab Spring to go to Tahrir Square. And essentially, one part of her call, she's, this is in the social media, of course, uh, is um, uh, I, a girl, am going down to Tahrir Square and I will stand alone. Uh, maybe people will come down with me. We want to go down to Tahrir Square on January 25th. This entire government is corrupt. If you think yourself a man, come with me on January 25th. Let him have some honor and manhood and come with me on January 25th. If you have honor and dignity as a man, come and protect me and other girls uh, in the protest. In other words, you're conflating uh, dignity and honor. And I don't see how you can deal with it without having that, that, um, that background. Because I know it does jar with me. It's always jarred with me. So because dignity to me is, is also about pride. It's about, OK, it's, an, it's human. But it has this, this link to honor that I think is something exactly. we need to be aware of. That Todd Lindbergh raised. So how do you deal with the other side, that social recognition is what leads some people to commit atrocities, uh, to harass or kill or drive from their homes another group. They're raising up their identity at the expense of someone else's. Look, if um, someone invokes the word dignity but 
has a institutionalized sexist notion of honor, it doesn't mean that that dignity uh, isn't an, an inherent value. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if a uh, you know a Nazi uh, invokes social recognition of you know the the Aryan race, that doesn't mean that the the idea is not a legitimate universal that there should be dignity for all. I, I we do have some colleagues who've been involved in this dialogue. We had a conference in June where our friend Evelyn Oswald from L, uh, the Legal Advisors Office at State, and Felice Gare, um, a scholar on the UN Human Rights, were concerned that if we move away from human rights to human dignity, there was a danger that human dignity would be this vessel that other people would use for their own purposes. And this is a, this is a danger we have to be aware of. Um, but I, I would welcome your specific suggestions on, on how do we account for some legacies of, of seeing dignity being connected to honor and that having a, a dangerous side effect in, in the long run. Um, I'd, love, I'd love your, you know, help us improve our introductory essay. Because part of what we're trying to do is provide a definition, and obviously there are definitions out there, and sort of reject uh, some of the more pernicious uh, definitions in this, this struggle. But there's no doubt about it. There are many If you want to write a chapter on gender, feel free. <laughs> that would be a good idea. Anyone else? Did you? Tom, did you have a question? I was just going to refer back to your, your chapter where you do elaborate a little bit on what you mean by social recognition. Uh, and it, it kind of creates a bridge to the idea of agency because you talk about social recognition of each person's inherent value and claim to equal access to opportunity. So there's a link there between real agency and sort of economic and social, as well as the political context and access to, to opportunity. Is that, is that a link you, you made yourselves between those two pieces of the definition? I know, it was something I was aware of and wanted to, I, want, I didn't want these to be two disembodied yeah, yeah, yeah. ideas. Um, but that access to opportunity was to tr trying to plug into this whole notion from human flourishing to the you know, human development report of potential right. and being able to have access to opportunity. I, I'm quite, having gone through human rights debates in the UN, of course, you know, distinguishing between, you know, equality of opportunity and equality of outcome is, you know, that is the rub in the debate about economic rights. Yes. Well, one point. Um, my name is Anum Singh. <laughs> I'm uh, As you look at uh, trafficking and services and other concepts of human dignity, all these obviously have cross-border activities, and therefore we need to look at the international rule of law, international organizations, because the activities are cross-border. But uh, my uh, point is, I guess it is implicit in your chapters, that unless you are going to fundamentally change the domestic rule of law and domestic institutions within countries, it's not going to work for us. Because as you work on the international cross-border activities through international regulations, you're trying to focus on the more formal sectors of the economy. And you drive all this informal, which it already might be. So my basic point is that international organizations and even others, they have to be involved. But in the end, if you're unable to change the domestic consensus, the social recognition implies domestic recognition consensus. Unless you're going to be able to somehow change domestic consensus, domestic group or domestic institutions, it's going to be very difficult to move ahead with this. And, and having said that, just one last point, as you look ahead where the world is going to be in the next 10, 20, 30 years, one likes to look at China. And China is going to go through demographic changes and is going through now urbanization. So how do we <coughs> apply all this to China? It's already large and we're already changing in ways that even they don't comprehend. Let me let me well let me note in the first point, you're absolutely correct. It needs to be done on both the international level and the domestic level. Uh, we can't come up with one set of norms that are in theory operating internationally and have domestic settings where they don't work. And 
that's a clear, clear point of what we're trying to accomplish here. Now, insofar as China's concerned, uh, I don't have the knowledge or expertise to wade too much into that. I don't know if Mark wants to do that as I pitch over. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you know, th this uh, question about whether, you know, millions and millions of people being lifted out of poverty in China and yet they're not, they're being more rule by law than rule of law um, is a question. I'm really interested personally in the great rising powers and who's being left behind in them. I just co-authored uh, an essay about those being left behind in India, which is otherwise an economic miracle. And the same is true in, in China. I just have one comment. Um, so earlier in this process, our colleague um, Todd Lindbergh said, well, you know, this, this notion of dignity is difficult. So what if you narrowed this book down and you focused on the most flagrant violations of dignity? And just focus on that. You know, that would be the atrocities victims, the human trafficking victims, maybe those who are killed by terrorists and some other things. And, and I, I, Tony and I said, well, let's make this harder on ourselves. Right. Let's make this harder on ourselves. And so, and this is a good bridge to the next panel, a paper like yours that looks at how can people um, be able to, to tap into what Tom was talking about, equality of opportunity, um, is necessary, that we could be proactively creating a, a, a legal regime in domestic settings in which people don't find themselves in an informal economy and they don't have any property rights that they can count on um, and therefore they can't take advantage of their, their potential. So I'm, I'm glad that we didn't just do the no. easy cases of atrocities in human, human trafficking. Anything more before we go to the next panel? Last. Why don't want to, if it's the last one, I don't want to take somebody. Somebody asked a question for somebody else. Anyone else? No. Nope. All yours. Okay. Uh, I found it curious, Tony, that the focus was on sort of the legal side of what is a terror. What is a terror? The question of what is a terrorist, um, and the issue of how do you deal with some of the the, 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 the legal matters around that. I, I think one of the issues, if the if the question is if, in fact, your definition of terrorism requires some kind of a political goal, right? And that political goal might be um, undermining some of the very values that, are, that we embrace. I think one of the interesting questions would be whether terrorism actually leads to a diminution of the recognition of human rights. In other words, is, one, is that one of the objectives, in a way? Could that be one of the objectives? where the fear of terrorism actually leads to societies like the United States perhaps uh, violating human rights or human dignity in some way. Okay. Terrorism is an instrument to, to doing that. So, cer so certainly the notion that there could be some groups engaging in terrorist activities specifically to be operating contrary to human dignity, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that would be something that I would, I would clearly recognize as one of the potential goals of terrorist groups. Uh, some, of, some, terror, some groups that engage in terror activities have a very clearly defined goal. You know, we want land, uh, we want to be liberated, we want something else. Other groups, it's much more raging against the machine, raging against the international system, raging against the international order, and while they would be, be terrorist groups, much of what they have as their goal is being destructive of human dignity. So I'd certainly acknowledge that. And I would also acknowledge that when I say we need to address some of the causes and some of the, the issues that lead to terrorism, we do not give them recognition and say, oh yeah, this is good to be destructive of terrorism. It's more, what are the conditions, what are the underlying circumstances that might lead groups to promote terrorism? Some may be legitimate, some may not be. My point is that some may be legitimate. Now, your question, as I understand it, is, well, wouldn't that then lead the United States to be destructive of the human dignity of those groups? Is that a sense? No, no, no. Human, human dignity, I mean, does terrorism terrorism can, can, a factor that actually militates against the promotion of human dignity? Does it, is it a corrosive mechanism that actually yeah. leads to democratic societies to go Wait, so Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. As a matter of fact, if we look, that I hope was my point yeah. in sort of talking about what we saw in the post 9 11 world. We saw a claim that presented itself as follows. 
So these groups don't follow the Geneva Convention. These groups totally disrespect human dignity. Therefore, those groups are not entitled to the protections under the Geneva Convention. Therefore, those groups have effectively forfeited their right, if you will, to be treated from a human dignity perspective. But does it, but does it even remove it from the public debate? Not their rights, but even human, dig, human dignity as a construct. Does, does it corrode that as a construct? What they're talking about is the, is the rights of the... So it depends. Are you, are you sort of suggesting, like, you know, the Patriot Act as a diminution yeah. of civil liberties? Yeah, I mean, so well, the example, the answer, so the answer is, <laughs> yeah, it depends on how you respond to it. In other words, sure. I could simply say, okay, we're going to waterboard you, we're going to do this to you, we're going to do these things to you. We're in a new world. We're in a new paradigm. We have to set aside uh, our understandings. We're at war. I mean, th this is the concept that you sometimes see articulated where people put aside our normal paradigms for operating. And I hope the import of what I'm saying is that that's wrong, that that's absolutely destructive to human dignity. Yes. There's a potential for that to happen, but it's, it's a choice. It's how we respond. We as a country, we as the international system. We need to make a claim that we're going to respect the human dignity of these individuals, even though they may not respect it. We have to stand by these higher goals in order to ultimately promote human dignity in such a way that we do not, and there are a variety of ways to do it. One, simply to say it's right that every individual is entitled to be treated this way even though they may not be behaving that way. Another way is to say, if we go down that road such that we say we can disrespect human dignity under these circumstances, then other states are going to do the same. Other actors are going to do the same. And we're going to lead to an international situation which is even more chaotic and even more destructive than what we currently have. So I would say, yeah, groups like Al-Qaeda, Groups that behave this way, yes, it could lead to a general diminution of human dignity, but that's why leaders need to stand firm and say, this is bad. On that point, I think you might want to tackle targeted killings um, because in some sense the, you know, the debate to. over treatment of, of detainees is being overtaken by events um, as there are fewer mm -hmm. detainees. And Hold them incommunicado or off them. Right. Which is worse. Right. Well, thank um, you, everyone. That was Thank enormous. you.